Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I'm just sitting here drinking my morning coffee. I'm going to give a real sip so the fake sip investigator can count that one first thing this morning when he comments below. Uh, I had someone ask me a really interesting question. It was either yesterday or the day before. They had said, you know, there's so many hormones put into our meat, uh, into animals that are grown for food today. Could that impact our natty status? Now, that's an interesting question, and I want to answer it uh, not from the philosophical question of what is natural, uh, because that's where we get into the, a bunch of silly nonsense very, very quickly, and it's not relevant to the topic. Uh, natural is a slang term or a marketing term used in the, the lifting world for someone who doesn't use anabolic steroids, right? That, that's what it means. They don't use anabolics. They don't use growth hormones, stuff like that. That's what natural means in this world. And it's used as a marketing term, just like it's always been used. It's all natural. Uh, and that, that's still a marketing word, buzzword used uh, in the fitness world. And uh, again, by proclaiming people natural, it gives them a certain marketing appeal, doesn't it? Uh, so it's all just about marketing anyways, but it's a slang term. So let's look at that. And what we want to look at is, number one, would it be making you take anabolics uh, in some amount that could actually be measured in the blood? In other words, could it have any meaningful impact, whether you give muscle growth or not? It's a secondary question, which we can answer also. Uh, so in other words, have you, you taken an anabolic agent that isn't really just similar to what's normally found in your food or would be found without all these hormones. Uh, number two, would it impact your ability to pass a drug test? All right. All right, up front, up front, we need to understand, I'm only gonna be able to cover the US. I know every one of you live in different countries, you have different laws. The majority of my subscribers are in the US. Uh, the only thing you are probably eating in the U.S. that has had growth hormones of any type, whether it's anabolic steroids, uh, some sort of recumbent growth hormone, things like that is going to be beef, right? For the majority of you, it's going to be beef. Uh, now, poultry and porcine, porcine being pork, uh, it's illegal to give these things to them in the United States. A lot of people are completely unaware of that fact. Now, uh, I don't even have to worry about the, the pork one because I don't really eat pork. It's not my thing. Before people say, Jason, are you Jewish or Muslim? No, I just I don't really care for pork. Uh, I just don't dig on swine, brother. But uh, I eat a lot of chicken. I eat a lot of steak. I consume a lot of dairy. We'll get over to those in a minute. Uh, as far as chicken turkey, pork, things like that. You don't have any of that stuff in it. They're given antibiotics. They're given a lot of antibiotics, but they are not given uh, growth hormones and they're not given steroids. If they do and they get caught doing so, the FDA will find the crap out of that company. It's illegal to do so. You know, people will jump up and I've heard it argued when you say that, well, you know, companies will do what they want. Well, you know, until they get caught and again, you have... Uh, <laughs> The USDA is what handles that. I'm sorry, I might have said FDA because I'm not fully awake. Uh, the USDA comes down pretty hard on stuff like that. They enforce it. It's just not worth it to them in terms of profit. And these are smaller animals. Uh, they have shorter feed times anyways. A lot of times they're not as worried about it. Uh, cattle, there's a lot of money to be made by doing so. So yes, they are given these substances. Uh, same thing, growth hormones are used to help with milk production in dairy cows. So... Really, if you're not consuming uh, beef-based products, and I don't, I honestly don't know the laws on goats, sheep, things like that. I really don't know. Uh, I would have to look that up. So maybe they could apply that in the beef category. Maybe you could count it like pork. I don't know. You'll have to look it up yourself. Uh, beef is your only concern. So what are we talking about in terms of the, the animal? Well, uh, my family are cattle ranchers. I've worked cattle ranch quite a few times until my dad sold the family cattle ranch uh, a number of years back. I had done some work there off and on. I used to work there on the weekends, building fences, working cows. And you don't give them that much. In other words, uh, what do we see guys all the time using on the internet of, of trimbalone acetate? 50 to 100 milligrams a day isn't uncommon these days. I, I don't think the guys using 100 are using real stuff though. It's not full dosed. So this trend is one of the most expensive raws for underground labs to, to acquire. It's literally five to six times the cost of testosterone for the powder. Uh, so, you know, and they're charging similar amounts for it. Yeah, right. On um, their profit ends, it doesn't work that way. But 
that's what they're taking. A cow is given 200 milligrams one time six weeks before slaughter. An implant, it's an implant that's pushed in behind the ear. Yes, I know how to do it. Uh, that 200 milligrams is for a lot of guys about as much as a lot of them would use in an entire week into themselves directly. Uh, now you can get results on less, but that's what's given to this cow. Six weeks before slaughter, it starts releasing immediately. All right, this stuff has cleared their system. Like the, the implant has probably released 95% of its hormone over that six weeks. There's probably a little bit left in the in the cartridges because it's uh, just you know it's got some cellulose with the drug mixed in. Yellow number five dye. That's the ingredients on it. Yes, I've read the labels personally. I've handled boxes of this stuff, and that's what's in it. That part of the animal isn't eaten where the implant is. That's thrown away because it's, it's behind the ear. It's the back of the head. Right? That's not sold commercially for food. It's not eaten. You have in a thousand plus pound animal, this substance has been dispersed. The majority of it has been utilized. It's been broken down. It's been metabolized You know, as it's bonded to the androgen receptors and everything else. All right, That means... At least 99% of that 200 milligrams has been used up. There might be, hypothetically, one milligram still in the system of that entire cow. Thousand pound animal. In other words, to get that full milligram, now keep in mind, guys are using up to 100 milligrams every day. To get to that one milligram, you'd have to eat the whole cow. The whole cow, all thousand pounds of it, the skin, the bones, everything, because that stuff is got the injured nerves. That stuff could be in all the tissues. You'd have to eat the organs, everything, everything, and the blood. Thousand pounds of animal. If you cook it, it breaks it down further. So you, you know how many of you guys are eating a thousand pound raw cow every day? <laughs> all right, assuming you can get that one milligram that way. It's also not orally bioavailable. That means the majority of it's broken down by your stomach acids. It's a reason oral anabolics have negative side effects on your health, like the liver. Uh, there's a reason for that. This doesn't have the attached uh, molecule to help it get through your liver, to get through your GI tract and everything else. So what do you think happens? You get almost none of it. You get almost none of it. You would have to eat the whole cow, and you wouldn't even get half of that one milligram would even reach your system if you ate the entire cow. Now, let's not even get into the logistics of eating a thousand pound raw animal. Uh, you know, it would obviously be ludicrous and completely biologically impossible by any stretch of the imagination. But even if you could, that tiny little trace left, the majority of it will not even make it to your bloodstream. You see the problem here? So, no, no, you're not going to be affected by it. Same thing with these growth hormones. Think about it in the same manner. The amount in the system of this animal, uh, growth hormones are temperature sensitive. They have to be refrigerated. They break down at room temperature. What's gonna happen when you start cooking this meat? Now keep in mind, there's little trace amounts. There's not even a full effective dose in the entire animal in its bloodstream or whatever at any given time. And yes, it's mostly in the bloodstream, the growth hormones, assuming they gave it bovine growth hormone. Uh, it, it's broken down by heat. Growth hormone gets destroyed if it sits at room temperature too long. What do you think happens when you cook it? it has to be refrigerated. Uh, so you see the problems here, guys. You, you, there's no way you're going to get this stuff in your system. Now the concern we get to is uh, the IGF-1, which we can talk about in dairy in a second. But the, the point is, you, you couldn't get any of this stuff enough in your system to fail a drug test. And let's not even cover the fact that growth hormone is species dependent, it's species specific. In other words, bovine growth hormone doesn't really work in humans and vice versa. Uh, but you, you couldn't fail a drug test, in other words, from eating meat. It's, it's not going to happen for any of these agents. Uh, some people have speculated clenbuterol in horses down in Mexico. Maybe I'm skeptical. Uh, again, knowing enough about clen and dosing, I don't think so. But no, so anyone who's claiming they're failing a drug test from eating meat is, is full of it. It's not possible. Not possible. So on to the IGF-1 in dairy. All right, the screaming about that is that there are high amounts of IGF-1 found in dairy. 
Now, it could be partially due to the, the hormones that they're giving to them seem to slightly bump it up. It does seem to impact it. Uh, some people even argue that the estrogens in there could impact it. But what you've got to remember is that you've got to think about the amount of milk you're consuming versus the, the amounts that would be in there of any of these things. It, hypothetically, could it affect you in theory? And a lot of uh, experts have They've speculated about it. They've speculated that the estrogens found in dairy could be causing certain women to uh, mature faster as girls and things like that. But you know what? There's environmental phytoestrogens. Well, phytoestrogens would be in plants. Xenoestrogens. There's environmental xenoestrogens that could also uh, account for that very, very easily. And what you need to remember is that these estrogens found, the trace amounts that could, in theory, be found in the milk, they're not orally bioavailable. All right, we make special substances to make hormones get into the system when you take them orally. Those are substances would no longer be attached once this stuff's in the bloodstream of the animal. All right, uh, your birth control pills actually have other molecules attached to the estrogen. <laughs> uh, you know, just like oral anabolics do in order for it to get into your system completely. It doesn't get through the GI tract, and there wouldn't be anything more than trace amounts to begin with. It would be absurdly low. So you're talking about all these other hormones, the IGF-1 and everything. Yeah, IGF-1 is really high in milk. It's high in all animals' milk, uh, whether the animal's been given drugs or not. Has anyone ever failed a drug test due to drinking milk? No. Now, as far as the growth factors concerned, WADA is concerned with, uh, they do say that colostrum products, including BioGrow, they do have concentrated oral IGF-1 in there. Right, because it's it's heavy, more heavily concentrated in colostrum than it is in milk, dramatically more concentrated. Uh, so WADA says that if you take a colostrum product, you're taking a banned substance. That's their official stance. They put out a memo on it. So if you've taken BioGrow, technically you're not natty, according to WADA. And there's good reason to think that they spiked some other stuff in that substance back when it first came out. Uh, real good reason to think so, and I covered that in the past but they probably have quit doing so a long time ago. So there's gonna be no evidence of it now. Uh, you're not gonna get the, those effects, anything else. So you take a product like that, I don't know, maybe, maybe you'd get enough to affect you, but here's the thing. You get more from the proteins involved in this than anything else, and that's what it's come down to. I mean, people talked about IGF-1 elevation from consuming dairy. Uh, yeah, that has been measurable, but most of it's probably not because of the IGF-1 and growth factors in it because they're not particularly orally bioavailable. Your, your digestive system breaks most of them down. Your stomach acids tend to destroy a lot of that stuff. That's the reason it's so concentrated in there so that the baby animal gets some of it. Uh, but what you're also getting, and again, this is what a lot of the experts say, it's the large quantity of high quality protein is causing IGF-1 to elevate. Now, is that a concern? No. Uh, you have vegans who will tell you, oh man, it causes cancer. It's been studied. It's been studied repeatedly. There isn't evidence that it causes cancer. Yes, it causes higher circulating IGF-1. But higher circulating IGF-1 is the reason a lot of times we eat more protein. It's the reason people use various anabolics. Circulating IGF-1, yes, is good for muscle growth. If you're, particularly if your body's producing it as a result of consuming the protein because that's what's happening at that point. It's because of the protein content of it. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And people say, well, doesn't that cause cancer? The vegans all say it does. The data doesn't show that. Meaning, when we start looking at population data, there's no correlation between high dairy intake and obesity, or not obesity. Well, obesity either, there's a reverse. High dairy intake and cancer. High dairy intake and cancer. No, doesn't seem to be there at all. Uh, when it's been looked at closely, only two types of cancer have they found any correlation between it. The rest, no effect. And it seems to be with women who, who consume a lot of yogurt have lower rates of ovarian cancer, and men who consume very, very large amounts of whole milk, no other dairy products, skim milk, yogurt, cheese, nothing else affected it, just whole milk, and large quantities has slightly higher prostate cancer. But that's correlational data, and that's literally all you have on that. So there's no reason to think that's a problem. So it's not a bad thing. So you're eating foods that cause your body to produce more IGF-1. Well, it's because you're eating a lot of high quality protein. 
with you know other stuff in it, calcium and all this stuff at the same time. Um, view that as a good thing. Uh, is that cheating? Sure, it's cheating. You're eating a food that's making your body release more growth factors. It means you gain more muscle mass. Yeah, that's cheating. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, again, we're coming back to the point of is that natural or not? Does that affect your natty status? I, I would say probably not. But who cares? Do you really care at this point? It's not like it's hurting your health and it's just foods that are giving you a more anabolic effect in your body. Go for it. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.